super important is listening. And it's one of the things I talk about at the beginning of the course. Listening, yeah. listening is not waiting to talk. Listening is listening, hearing what someone says and then reacting to what they have to say. So that's how you can create a unique selling proposition. You may have to listen first. the management and transparency is what's very important. So once you submit a referral, you're going to have your own home advantage account and it's going to tell you where everything sits. So if you have 10 referrals that you've sent into the network, it's going to give you all 10 referrals. It's going to tell you every milestone that that client is sitting in, whether they're touring homes, whether they're an escrow. And you now can manage through the home advantage application as far as what your pipeline looks like for the referrals that you've sent. And so it's pretty sophisticated uh, and it's, it's all click of a button, guys. Thank you for jumping in, everyone. For those of you who don't know Ruth, Ruth Katchen is a friend of mine. She's brilliant, but she won't tell you. She's a very smart woman, uh, has taken the time to, to really outline the essentials of creating success or increasing the ability to create your success in real estate. And so today... We want to just talk about what some of the main steps are. If you're interested in the full length of steps, she's got an amazing course that I suggest you go into. It's not very expensive at all, which we'll drop in a link here and there. Uh, but Ruth, thank you for jumping on. I appreciate this. This is the first time we're doing this. We're going to do this a few times. And I want to just get right into it and talk about building the foundation of your real estate business. A lot of us that are newer that are listening in, some of us are veterans and, and some are in between, right? Right. We still look to see if maybe we got something wrong along the way, right? Just because we're, we're veterans or kind of figured it out, it doesn't mean we're not continually learning. This is why I love what you've built here, uh, focusing on the essentials, because I move so fast that I miss some of the essentials. I remember um, that when I was younger, I was in martial arts and I was stuck in green belt forever. And I didn't know why. So I kept on going to my sensei. I was like, when am I going to test? When am I going to test? He's like, well, you've got the basics. You don't have the basics down. You don't have the base down. You're really good at this. You're really amazing at that. And then I, that was hard for me to hear. So I think this applies yeah. to everyone. And where would you start, though, if we're looking at the essentials, where would you start? Well, I always think of, of everything from the perspective, kind of what you're saying from the essentials. And the first thing I think about is mindset. You have to have the right mindset or at least know what your mindset is, why you're doing something and what what is the most important thing about about the mindset. And it's, you know, what can I say? Do I have the magic answer to find out mindset? No, I, I don't, because I can't tell you what your mindset is. You can't tell me what my mindset is. We have to do the work and discover and figure it out. And I think that's kind of hard because I, I had this um, discussion with someone. He was a an agent who'd been in the business some gazillion years, like I'm serious, like 30 years or so. And he was older and I uh, was working first as his assistant, learning the business. And uh, then he was my managing broker and whatever. And I started talking, he was going to do a new website. And I started talking to him about what his why is and his mindset. And he goes, he he goes. I don't know what 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 is my why? What what do you mean? <laughs> and so I I sent him Simon Sinek's. You know, has some YouTube videos and stuff to think about that. And he finally said to me, "I I can't do this. Can't you tell me what my why is?" And I said, <laughs> "Well, no. Then then that's my why, not your why." So you know that I think that's essential in doing anything if you want to have the passion and commitment to be consistent and persistent. And um, I think those are things that we need no matter what it is we do in life. And one of the things I find the most interesting about Simon Sinek and what he says about the why is that your why has always been your why. It was your why when you were five years old. It's your why when you're 20 years old. It's your why when you're 30 years old. It may, may morph in the way that you 
um, express it or manifest it. But the the why is always the why. And I looked back at that not that many years ago, and I think Tristan, you and I have talked about this a little bit. Um, and and figured out what mine really is and and how how can I bring it to others? So that's how this whole thing started with learning the whole process. And it's interesting in, in teaching this class so far. And um, you know, I've had several hundred people take the class in the in the past year. And what I've learned is that. I was kind of shocked. Sometimes there was all these really experienced um, agents in the class. And I thought, what are they doing here? I'm going to tell them what they don't know. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, you know, to me that I thought that doesn't make sense. But then I realized um, that they didn't know they got their process. I just go through it in a methodical way on the sell side and then on the buy side and add a few other things in about marketing and getting clients because of course uh, lead generation and getting clients is essential because you can't have a business. And I, and I think you have to know your why to do all of that. Um, and the first part of this course, the first hour or so is all about mindset, growth mindset, um, teaching yourself how to learn and how to how to do better and what the components are because i don't think there's anyone you me anyone who hasn't struggled with with growth mindset somewhere in their in their life and if for no other reason when we were all little like in third grade you know the teacher said like don't do that you're not good at that do this, you know, whatever. And they would say, you're not good at math. Don't do it. That's the big no. one in elementary school. They tell you, you're not good at math. You're not good at science. So it freaks people out. So then all these, all of a sudden there's all these people who feel like they're not, can't do these things. And we can all do those things. You just have to make up your mind and learn how to do it. And it may even involve learning in a different way. You know, if you're an auditory learner or a visual learner, or you like to read or a combination of, of all those things. I mean, sometimes things don't make sense unless you show it to someone. Um, I could give you a little example from my background as a um, uh, as a former musician. I say former because I'm you know not doing that anymore. But I have two degrees in music, and so I'm pretty well educated on that. And uh, used it to teach people and students. And a lot of times they didn't understand rhythm. You know how it's broken up, and rhythm is basically just fractions. So if I drew a pie. And, and a circle and made a pie and showed them that this is one, you cut it in half, this is two. So that's that's how that time works. And you make it four and, and, and keep subdividing. Then all of a sudden when they'd see this visual, they got it. So as a person who teaches someone about real estate, you have to try everything you can try to get people to understand and practice what they do. And um, so that's a long, that was a long answer to the mindset question, but I think um, reflecting back on that and not having someone tell you what your mindset is and you discovering it and not saying, oh, I love what Tristan said, Let that's what, that's mine. You know, I'm not you and you're not me. Your life experience is yours and mine is mine. So that's how we have to figure it out. And um, the common, most common question I've got answered to this question I've gotten over time is when I ask what, what your mindset is, is people say, I want to make money. Why am I doing this? Make money. And mm -hmm. I, I said, well, making money is a what, not a why. So, you know, uh, like the, the result of that what may answer your why, like I have to support my family, I'm the breadwinner, whatever, those kinds of things. Um, but there can be other things. I, you know, the co most common thing I also hear is I wanna make money, I wanna help people. Well, that's a pretty general thing. If you wanna help people, you can donate food to a food bank. Yeah. You know, uh, so, you know, there's all kinds of other things. And in the, in the, in that kind of why, you have to get more specific. Maybe you do want to donate food to a food bag, so you need money to do that. Maybe you want to go and teach um, underprivileged children in Africa, but you have to have money to do that. So that yeah. can fuel your why. Anyway, um, I'm fascinated in in some ways with with all of this because we're we're all a little different, and and yet we aren't. You know. What do you find that 
a great example of a why is for real estate agents in, in particular, since you've been you've been holding this course for for a little bit now. Well, the, the helping people, but really you have to expand the helping people to to an, an individual thing and say, how can I benefit you, meaning you, the client? So mm -hmm. the first thing you want to do is find out from them, what are you looking for in a real estate agent? Why are you talking to me? And, and then, you know, if you can take your I want to help people, morph it into talking to others, then, you know, then you get yourself in a good place with someone. Uh, I think the other thing is, is we're all different, you know, um, yet there's a million of us doing this, right? So I've always said it's like, how, what one of the first things I say in this class is, what are you going to do to distinguish yourself in this sea of people? You see that sea mm -hmm. of buildings behind me? That's exactly yeah. it. But there's one that's the tallest. How is that doing that? You know? Like that. So that's like my, my- Is that thought. where you is that where you find that we can then bring in our unique skills to stand out or we create a, a unique selling proposition? What what do you think works there? Well, either either one, you know, your unique selling proposition might be different for different people. So if you're looking for, okay, I mean, if you're looking for, I need a house for my family, it has to have this, this, and this, and so uh, whatever. So you want to be listening. That's the other thing that I bring up a lot that I think is um, super important is listening. And it's one of the things I talk about at the beginning of the course. Listening, yeah. listening is not waiting to talk. Listening is listening hearing what someone says, and then reacting to what they have to say. So that's how you can create a unique selling proposition. You may have to listen first. Interesting. Yeah, well, we do find that on listing pitches or presentations, and, and even with buyer presentations, right? It, it comes down to you really listening. And as you're listening, addressing the questions that they have, and then creating that trust. And a lot of the times, and I don't know if it's been the same experience for you, but a lot of the times we don't ever open up our listing presentation or even our buyer presentation. It goes untouched and they just say, okay, where, where do we sign or how do we work with you or how do we proceed, right? So, right. and that that comes from just being being authentic enough to connect with people. Well, and showing your value somehow before you have to get to all that. I like to send the listing presentation or the mm -hmm. buyer presentation ahead via email, let them look at it. They may have questions and then um, appeal to them through my listening to their comments or questions um, on how I can help them. Because, you know, some of the stuff in that you have to tell them you want to review it, the, <laughs> certainly the process, you know, and all of that, but it becomes you know, they can find that on the internet. It's not, it's not, it's not rocket science. I hate, I hate to use that word, but you know, um, but goes with lab coats. It makes you know. sense. So I, I have a list of like, I have a list of these five things that, that, that I've come up with for developing a unique selling proposition. And, and this is just, specifically for real estate right now, but you can apply this to anything. And tell me if I'm missing anything. But number one is you identify your strengths. You make a list of your unique strengths, your skills, your your experiences, right? Whether they're inside of real estate or not, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Think of what you're great at and what you're typically better at than most people that you hang out with, right? So now you have identified your strengths. That's easy. Make a list. And maybe it's hard. Maybe a lot of people don't do it. That's number one. Number two, understanding your target audience, because now you're, you're trying to correlate it. It's like, okay, I've got this a great, amazing thing. Now let's identify what my audience is. Who am I targeting? Am I targeting the people that are buying a home for the first time, right? How do my strengths match that? Am I targeting move up buyers? Am I targeting an older generation who's held on to a home for a long time, maybe owns multiple homes? And now they're going to downsize, right? Or maybe completely different. It's luxury. The, the whole point is yeah. understand your audience 
because now you're going to start identifying that strength and saying, how does it correlate with my audience so I can solve their problems, right? That's number two. Okay. And number three is research the competition. And I know you're familiar with a SWOT analysis, but when I'm looking at this, I'm taking a look at, well, who else in my area is doing well? And I want to know what they're doing well at and where are the opportunities, right? So I can come in and say, hey, in the opportunities that I have, does it match my strengths? Because if it does, like for me, social, I always look, what's the social presence and what's their online presence? Because that's my strength. And then I go, got it. SWOT analysis done. Number four, focus on the benefits because you know what we do? We typically focus on the opposite, which is weird, right? Yeah, it's like answering the objections, you know? <laughs> yeah, here's where I look at my unique selling proposition and say, and say to myself, I'm like, okay, what are the benefits of working with me that that makes me unique, right? If I was looking at me and saying, now, great, I'm going to help out first time home buyers. What's unique about me that's going to want them to work with me? And initially for me, when I did this, I was like, well, I'm new. That means I'm going to have a lot more time to pick up the phone and spend that quality time with you through a process where if you go to a bigger agent or a team, they're probably not going to have that much time for you because they're doing so many other things. They, they, they've been in the business for a while and sometimes they're successful. Lastly, test and refine. We don't do this. So now I look at all the different people that we target audiences and think, well, how do I approach it? And they're going to need a different selling proposition in some cases. And if we're not testing and refining, we'll never do And I know both of us here do it well, but when we're looking at, at the essentials, that number five, testing and refining, it becomes an essential to everything you're doing, right? Right. Well, I think that and that may be the one where people fall down a bit because, you know, as a problem solving method, you would want to establish what's the problem? How do I solve it? What do I have to solve it that are my unique ways of, of possibly doing this? And I'll, I'm trying to cover your five things or get to get to the fourth one and then trying it and seeing if that works. And then then saying, you know, I talked to these people and I thought their whole thing was having this great yard for the kids. And they actually really I kept pushing this great yard for the kids thing. Mm -hmm. And they really didn't want the great yard for the kids because there's a there's a playground down the street. And I didn't I didn't listen to that. So when you go back and you refine your pitch, you want to refine it considering those things it's it's basically an iterative iterative process like we have in science you know um it's how do we solve the problem we try this this didn't work let's make this better let's not let's tweak here and there and then let's go back and do it again you know um it, it and it's hard because real estate is um a live a live breathing conversation, essentially, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have the chance in that conversation to possibly rescue ourselves where we screwed up, you know, if we screwed up and we hurt ourselves. That's where, if we hear ourselves, I meant, I meant, and that's where self evaluation is a really important tool when you're when you're doing this. You know, that's why I don't like doing these things on automatic pilot, like reading a script on the phone or even even yeah. in in person while you're going over something on the internet with with a client or your your presentation you want to really engage in the process so that you're not just automatic say oh well you said this so i say that no you want you want to make sure that you've you've really heard them in your and, in your master class that you have the the one about the essentials of running a real estate business with the documents that you give out, are do any of those documents tackle the this part about identifying your why and and really creating this this unique selling proposition through your strengths? Um, yes, I have as much as you can in 
on checklists of paper. I, I have those things. I have a whole document on what what is your why. I have a either a quiz you can take to to find out whether you're a growth mindset person or a not oh. growth mindset person. Okay. It's a simple little quiz. And honestly, most of the people after I've given it to them, they come out pretty, pretty good because they, you know, I think most people do want to learn. <clears throat> Excuse me. It just comes out when, when we're actually doing it. And yes, I have things that would be your, your um, selling proposition as well. Unique selling proposition. I have a, mm -hmm. I have a whole document on that and, and the listing presentation, what you should include the buyer's presentation, what you should include. And I caution that you may not want to include all of this stuff. Cause I've had people say, you know, come out with these 18 or 20 page, you know, listing presentations. And I, I really don't think anybody wants to sit through that. <laughs> No, not at all. Not at all. And I love that that you talk about the listing presentation and the buyer presentation, because what I've often found is once I have it outlined, like you, you help go through this. Once I have it outlined and I've gone through it multiple times, I internalize it so that I don't have to look at it and go page by page and bore people to death for the most part. And so I think doing that right consistently like you teach, that's why I love the examples that you have them, right? It's like, hey, this is what you should be including. This is what it looks like. I think that that's pretty powerful the more we repeat it uh, to ourselves because it internalizes what exactly what we do a focus right. on our unique selling propositions. Right. And then comes within coming, coming to that is that you have researched who these clients are prior to this experience so you have an idea where to go with them something you may really like about them that you saw on facebook or twitter or whatever wherever you research them i google everybody and it's it's a bit of stalking but i uh, you know kind of but it it helps you understand who they are i'm not suggesting honestly mm -hmm. to contrive the conversation to um to make it into something that's right, that obviously that they've um, posted on their Facebook page, you you need to be genuine. And if you can go through yeah. that, you might find something that you really like about them. Like maybe they're a really good. I always use hockey. I don't. I don't know why. Um, maybe their their kid is a really good hockey player, and you you see that. And I had a kid who was a really good hockey player, so I. I often, you know, gravitate toward that. And I've actually mm -hmm. made conversations with people on the phone that, you know, uh, that happened to connect. We connected that way just because we did, because we yeah. knew what it was like, you know, and or something you admire about them. Maybe they're um, uh, a great runner or a marathon runner. And I would admire that because I'm not, you know, and I would say, <laughs> you know, um, I always imagined myself as that, which I'm not. Um, anyway, so yeah, I okay. think all those things are important. And getting back to how do you do this to prepare for a conversation with someone who you don't know? And in, a, in the class, I talk about different degrees of knowing. Uh, we, we do a little bit of role playing with, with that. In other words, cool. someone who you may know, who may be, let's say, your brother's your brother's neighbor or your brother's friend or somebody you could get information about someone you met on Facebook who you probably don't know anything about at all except what they post on Facebook so you no. have to dig a little little further than than that and perhaps approach them in a different way okay. um, and that's one, another thing and the way I get to this is uh the idea of what what um what you call um uh, method acting. In other words, and I'm not oh. saying fa method faking, I'm talking about method acting. And so I don't want it that to be confused with uh, being contrived or faking what you're saying, pretending you're interested when you're nodding, mm -hmm. the body language and the nodding and the arm, you know, all that stuff. Because I, I really do kind of think that's, I think everybody knows about that already. I think yeah, they get plus that. Plus the moment that they realize that you're, you're, you're actually doing that, you lose all connection because they feel manipulated. 
Right, right. And there's a lot of things that lead to that feeling manipulated. Even the idea of empathy and all of that can lead to someone feeling manipulated. If you, if you're faking the empathy and, oh, I understand, or I know, no, you know? And so um, I, I think that's, yep. and, and that's one of the hardest things that I talk about, I think in the class, because it's a little scary to take yourself into the place of actually experiencing what someone might be experiencing. One of the examples I use is if you're going to list a house and the person has either just lost a spouse and therefore has to sell their house, they're they're probably not happy, you know, they're probably pretty sad. So I my suggestion is for you to go through that, put yourself in that place as if you were preparing for this role as as the the person to talk to them and understand where they may be coming from that way when you go to talk to them you won't get all upset you know because I'm the kind of person like would start to cry and oh my god and you know <laughs> and that's not a good look usually so um yeah. What what I suggest is you go through that at home, and what happens is it's this is again about growth mindset. It's your head which understands this emotion. Your heart teaches your head what that feels like, and you critically think. And so when I'm talking to you, the now widow, I, I my voice, my eyes, my body language all reflects the things that it that it felt in that time and that's how you come across more authentic um because it's not i shouldn't have even put it like that come across more authentic that is more authentic you know yeah it definitely is i agree i agree with you on that i think that the challenge to that is we're taught the opposite when it comes to the essentials right we want to right. what we hear is you want to mimic, you want to, you want to find something that, that you agree with, but we never transition out of it, right? To really connect with people. With with that, I want to talk about the fundamentals of lead generating, marketing, because you do go into that. Quite a bit. And I remember when, when I first started and where I am, when I had to shift to and where I am now, they look a little different, but they still use a lot of the core things, right? So I started door knocking cold calling uh, then i shifted to online leads then then social media right and now we're doing a combination of everything and open houses too but everything still focuses on our past clients and sphere when you're looking at the fundamentals or the essentials for lead generating first what does that look like where do we start with your course well, I go over the different ways that you can generate leads. And um, of course, that's the biggest question. I think it's the biggest question. However, a lot of people don't ask, they don't ask that question. And I, I don't really know why it is they think that they're going to magically come from somewhere. I've, I've gotten a lot of questions about, I, I had a, a person once who who asked me, we were doing one-on-one -on -one and she said, her managing broker said not to door knock and that that's old school. And I thought, I said, well, why, you know? And, um, uh, and, and she said, it just is. I said, well, you know, it could be, it could be old school because of depending how you do it, where you do it, how you feel about doing it and all of that. And I said, I would never discourage someone from trying something they're willing to try. How, how could you do that? Well, uh, I think there's appropriate, the door knocking, what I talk about a lot is if you're doing an open house and how you can door knock in a certain uh, circle prospecting of, of where the open house is and uh, invite people maybe to an event the day before so they can get familiar with with the neighborhood. And I, I, I'd be a person who would promote that as like a social thing. Come see your neighbors, um, get out and see see what their house is like. That way then you've taken away the people from the open house who are just want to see what the house is like because it's your neighbor and they want to see what you're asking and all of that. And um, put that, put a positive spin on that and say, mm -hmm. hey, look what they're doing in their house. Look what they did and what the, what they could get for that. And, and as you build um, that 
you can turn that into the whole big thing, having a before, a during, and an after. And after the house closes, you, you uh, all these clients, 100 or 200 people, where you can get out and contact them to, to be um, potential clients. And, you know, how many are you going to get? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's people ask me that, am I going to get any? I was like, well, do I know? I don't, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't have those, those powers, but if you don't do it, I can tell you, I can tell you one thing, <laughs> it won't happen. The other thing I say is that everybody finds something that works for them and not to do everything at once. I feel like you should start with one thing, get really good at it, mm. pick at it, pick it, and then add to those things so that you you have the opportunity to get get good at at one thing that might be your thing and the other thing i tell people is like and and this is really and i have door knocked and um i have door knocked under this circumstances like if someone comes to my door i do not answer it okay so if you're that person who doesn't answer the door then maybe if you don't like it done to you, then maybe you are not, that is not the right thing for you to do to someone else. You have to figure out a different way of doing this. But at the same time, uh, it's, it's, I don't know, no brainer to me, um, real estate as is most sales is a lead generation business. So if you do not have leads, you do not have business. And, you know, uh, you have to get business. You were, you think, sorry. You think we should start with, so at, at every level that we're at, whether we're brand new in the middle or been in it for a while, do you think we still have an opportunity to capitalize on our sphere or, and how do you, how do you think we should approach that? Well, I, th I think the <clears throat> sphere is a good place to start with. A lot of people don't realize what their sphere is, that they can take everyone in their phone and maybe everyone even in their email list and, and start to create uh, a new list of people that you know and, and reach out to them. And, you know, I, I, the, the first email, and, and I did this, I, I reached out and um, to, I didn't have many people in my area that I knew because I was new here and um, I didn't, I didn't have family here or anything or really very many friends. So I had to reach out all over and, and tell people, Hey, this is what I'm doing now. And if you know anybody, I'd uh, really appreciate that and try to keep in touch in a, Hey, want to hear what I'm doing in a positive way is what, um, and this is what's going on now. And, and as you grow this sphere, you start to add value um, to what you're offering people. Uh, not so much do you want to, I, I, I actually worked for a managing broker who I was trying to, I did inside sales and I was trying to do other things. And he said, just ask them if they want to buy or sell a house. And I thought, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, I, I <laughs> that I said, well, that's not really me. You know, he said, well, you need, you know, and so, uh, I didn't, I didn't do that, but you can start a conversation. And if you start that conversation, um, you, uh, have different ways of, of showing value with the, with the, um, sphere. One of the great things that I found is, is, um, um, Hobart. Because people who own own a home already, they uh, they tend to you can you can get them signed up on Homebot. They get all that information. You get all their information, and and it keeps in touch with them as you. But it's not you, you know, uh, constantly um, asking them about buying or selling. I like to give information about. Um, I think entertaining food. I, I used to do a newsletter and uh, have a um, drink of the month, you know, a cocktail oh. of the month and, uh, cool. you know, and have the have the picture and how to make it and stuff, just stuff like that. Um, or going to local neighborhood restaurants and saying, hey, I, I went here and this was really great. And I love this part of it. Then you can connect with the the person whose restaurant it is, and um, they may be willing to have you do some kind of happy hour there or where you meet people and all of that. This I, this all works in a non-COVID environment. This has not worked very well in a COVID environment, um, which, you know, we're 
out of now or coming out of anyway, but uh, I that, start, started that. Though on that note, though, I think what's worked well for us on a team is as I start bringing in newer agents or or agents that are just coming back in the business, um, I I typically have them say, okay, well, who are, who, who are your core sphere? Like, tell me, tell me who would recognize you at a supermarket or at the gym or at a comic book store, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Since I go to comic book stores uh, and, and then write those out. And then what you want to do is get a list from, if you're joining the team, from me, from our team of the vendors that we use that, that typically somebody that would own a home or be renting a home would need that's local, right? And, and we would outline those and say, look, I've got this great list. This way, what I find, uh, Ruth, is a challenge in reaching out to people. If you don't have a good reason for connecting, every call sounds like a business call and it's a turnoff for a lot of people. So this is why we try to, we try to say, if you can, Let's have a reason that sounds like the less business, the better. Events, coffee, let me give you value through this list I have, right? Whether it's an electrician, a plumber, a mechanic, uh, here's a list of all the local people that we trust. And I just wanted to give it to you. You might need it, right? What should I, is it okay if I text it to you or should I email it over to you, right? And all of a sudden they're like, oh, that, that's cool. And if they don't know what you're doing, they'll ask, well, what are you up to? I'm like, oh, well, I, I just got into real estate. So right, 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 right. It helps yeah. a lot, especially if they're people that already know you, right? Because they'll recognize you. So it becomes a lot easier. We're just trying to always find avenues that make it a lot less business-like and more along the lines of really connecting and adding value to people's lives. Well, I think, and uh, I had um, a, an agent that I was, training, teaching, whatever. And he loved golf and he would go to the driving range every day. And I said, I want you to do two things. I want you to go there every day at the same time. And I want you to just to, to play golf, say hi. Eventually someone's going to, you know, you're going to have a little chat here and there. It's going to be the same people. And uh, we have a top golf here that's nearby. And that's, it's the same thing. People go there and they do, do that. And I said, go there and just do it all the time. And you'll start to be, you know, established as one of the people who's there. And then eventually they'll ask you what you do. And, you know, you'll get in that conversation. You don't have to say, you know, uh, and I've had people do this. Uh, I was actually taught to do this when I first got my real estate license. Go to Starbucks and sit there and pull out MLS sheets and people will ask you about the real estate market. And I thought, you know, well, they didn't. I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, just saying, because it, it's too it's too much in their face, you know, and that, uh, and so I think that that's another thing. And I'm not saying not to be thinking about it all the time, but it's, it's a relationship business. You need to cultivate relationships. There are different ways to cultivate relationships today in 2023 than there were in 1995 or, you know, even, even before that. And so you have to be on top of what they are, but people still want that they want communication and they want relationships so you know uh cultivate what you like to do like if you like comic book shops you would probably not ever see me there but um uh you know i might be somewhere else and so if you know like dog park like dog park is a great i thought i think is a great way to meet people because you you get to talk to a a pet a dog and you can show your warmth and kindness and all of this. I mean, I sound very fake when I say that. And I don't mean it like that. But, you, um, <laughs> you know, it's like every anyone on here who sees me because when I'm out and walking or running and I see a dog, I talk to the dog first. And so and but you know what? Because the owner loves their dog. It 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 loosens them up, you know, um, True. and, and people, you know, will will talk. So, so whatever it is you like or do, or feel comfortable with, or know about, do it, be there. And that starts to 
cultivate those relationships. I agree. I think we overthink it as as agents where we we think that we have to go out and actually do things that involve work, a lot of work. Whereas if you incorporate what you already love and do more of that, people will naturally be connected with you and want to talk to you about whatever it is that you do. Because it just comes up, Ruth. Like we're out there playing pickleball and it always comes up every single, it's nuts. It's like, no, oh, I know, I know it, I know it. Like, oh, yeah, I, I, I do real estate. So yeah, it comes up no matter what you do, as long as you're doing what you love and it shows, right? So it makes, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. All right, Ruth, so I'm looking at now, I've got where we would start for, for lead generating. When it comes to developing our standards, what does that look like in your head? Because I know you talk about this in your course, but developing our standards, why do we need to? And what does that look like? When you say standards of practice, do you mean? Or, um, okay. Uh, I think it's hard to say this, but you know that most of the most of the world looks at real estate agents as um, not the highest level of uh, salesperson. I don't know how else to, to put it, but it's actually very complicated. There's so much you have to know and do to do this. So um, if you have an organized procedure of how you do things and how you talk about things and approach them, you will impress your potential client with your efficiency, professionalism, and, and knowledge. And above all, I, I think because real estate involves so much, not so many things to know, if you don't know something, I mean, I'm a big, you know, I don't know, but I'll find out. You know, I mean, and that's, that's what you need to do. I mean, you would do that with your, I hope, with your kids when they ask you stuff. I mean, they ask you all kinds of things. How could you, I mean, I have often wondered, like, why do you think I know all these things? I don't, I mean, you know, I mean, not the encyclopedia, you know, and yeah. um, <laughs> the chat GPT is, yes, I know. Well, now we have a, we have a, you know, we have a friend, best friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so that's, um, what I what I think and plus it's you know my personality and my nature when I first got my real estate license and they supposedly taught me what to do I thought uh, uh, there's all these things we're missing and so I made a uh, list for which I'm fairly famous for um, and I kept track of all these things it's like well you know you need to do that that, 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 you know, all these things. And then at some point I thought, you know what, I'm going to put this together. And I think everybody needs to know this, mm -hmm. you know? So um, that's, that's why. And, and I think people do like it. It's, it's, it's funny, but people who've taken the course um, seem to comment on, you know, it's really a nice refresher to remember all the things that they're supposed to do. And, and, and not everything has to be in the exact order. I'm not that inflexible, you know, but it, sometimes there's a group of things, you know, that, that has to be done at one time. Like if your listing agreement is signed, you have to do a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you need, to, you need to make sure you remember what all those things are. Talk to that uh, I talk about that with your seller so that they know about photographs, getting the house in shape for photographs, what it should look like, uh, what will make the best impression, what kind of schedule are you talking about for showings, what is your timeline for buying and sell uh, for selling, um, and and all of those things. And you you have to have all that in order, and you will impress someone if you're uh, ready to go and have I don't know sheets checklists. I have I have one for. Um, for the seller as well that that shows the the order of of stuff so they know and a lot of people already know and if they tell you just like going through the listing presentation may not be their first time uh, selling or first time buying i just like to have all of that there if they want to refer to it fine they don't need to hear me talk about it if, yeah. if they, they they don't want to but i think it's important to have an order of a standard of procedure, an order of operations, if you will, like, you know, we're doing higher math, which yep. we're not. So I like that. I like your approach. All right. Out of all of the things that you teach in the master class in this course that you go through, 
what typically stands out the most with agents? What do they come back to and say, wow, that was that was a really great piece that I needed? The the two there there are two things, I think. One is just the basic seller, you do all this stuff, buyer, you do all this stuff. And here's where the two overlap. And so mm -hmm. what you have to do if you are a listing agent and then you have a buyer going under contract, then what do you have to do as the sellers, the listing agent? Um, and that procedure people like. The other thing um, is the, the mindset piece. I tell stories about myself a little, which I'll be honest, I've learned I've learned a lot by doing this. At first, it was like, I don't want to tell anybody about my life or anything that I, anything about it. And, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, little by little, I put these little things, I thought, well, you know what? This isn't making sense without this. So I put little things and little more and more. And now I see, um, I have a proctor who, uh, because in Colorado, I have uh, six CE credits for this class. And so I have a proctor watching the people and everything. And she says, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I feel like who would want to listen to me talk for all this time? Apparently, I hope there's some of you out there, but anyway, yeah. uh, you know, uh, anyway, so she said, they're really captivated by some of the stuff I tell that are my personal stories. And um, I'm, you know, I think, that's the hard part for anybody, but in all the things you talked about in lead generating and getting more familiar and creating relationships with people, it's the stories that you're going to tell that are going to resonate with them. Always. That's so interesting yeah. that you say that. I have noticed that. I think it's because we can all learn from the stories. We're like, hey, remember the time Ruth did that and it didn't work out well? Or remember when she said she did that and it did do well? That's what people do remember. It's interesting. Right. And, and you, I, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. And then you can support that with, with the logical things that you need to do. Interesting. I love that. Yeah, no, I mean, that's really true. And when I'm trying to tell them, for example, before you go on this listing appointment, find out who owns the house and make sure you are talking to the person that can actually sell the house because sometimes they can't. And I have a couple of really good stories about that. And so I, I tell them because um, even though one of them is fairly embarrassing because one of them was my mother. And um, <laughs> so, um, you know, it still, it brings the point true because if I just, it's the same as teaching anything. If I just tell you all this stuff and I go on about lists and blah, 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 you know, how much do you want to hear me droning on about all this stuff? But if I tell you a good story where um, that's not the same story as anyone else's, um, you know, it might be more fun, you know? And that's what it comes down to. So Ruth, uh, when is your master class? When is this course going to take place? Because I know we've been putting the link in there. Uh, it, it's May 1st and 2nd. And it's from what? Well, let's see. Um, go. Okay, got you it. got it. Master class, May first. A comprehensive guide to running your real estate business, and it goes over what you'll be doing May first and second, from eleven a.m. to two p.m. Pacific, two p.m. to five p.m. Eastern. It's on Zoom. Uh, you can get your ticket over on the right hand side here. We'll put the link up there, and then any any questions you have, Ruth, prior to this. If people want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you to ask questions or or while they're watching? Um, do you want me to put my phone and email in the chat? Whatever is easier for you. Text, email, uh, Instagram. Uh, 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 yeah, Instagram. My Instagram is at Ruth Catchin, at Ruth Catchin Real Estate. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I've changed it a few times. Yeah, no problem. There we I'll go. Look I'll look for it yeah, right now. Yeah. Um, right. yeah, no, I got it. Ruth Catchin. Ruth Catchin Real Estate Coaching. There it there is. There we go. Catchin. And I tried to make everything the same. So uh, Ruth Catchin Real Estate at gmail.com. I know it's long, but you know, once you do it, it's like, okay, you just have to 
No. Um, and my phone number, I can put in there. If you can text me anytime, not anytime, but you know. Yeah. Just... I, I, tur I turn my phone off when it's not okay. So it's all yeah. right. I got there it. There we Perfect. go. And um, all of that. And um, <laughs> I guess one of the things, because it says on there, I one of the things we didn't talk about is I do use the problem solving method and from STEM education and all of that. And basically talk about um, how, how the, your job in real estate is really as a problem solver, whatever that problem is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have to figure out how to solve that and try different things and that never to be disappointed or discouraged if one thing doesn't work, because, you know, there's always something else. Very true. I think we are we are problem solvers because we get so many things thrown our way. Great point on that, Ruth. Right. All right, Ruth, thank you so much. Let's do this again before May 1st so we can get more people on there to learn and, and become better real estate agents. So that's, that, that sounds thanks. great. I, I appreciate appreciate your time and, and all that. And um, all of you looking forward to meeting you again. Thanks. Thanks for doing this. Have a good thanks. weekend. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye. We'll